Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and guess where I'm at today? Tonight, right now, I'm in Jimmy Bedford Studios, and I'm meeting, again, the legendary Jim Bedford. How are you, baby? I'm great. Man, you look good. You look good, man. You got your leather coat on. Let's just roll right through this, man. Let's All talk right. about. Let's talk about the beginning of your life. How did you really get into it? I know you've been influenced by your dad, but tell me about how that all began back in the day with you. Well, my dad was playing music and I was exposed to it. And the thing that my dad really did for me was he got me lessons with some of his professional people that were playing guitar in his band. And the thing that really helped was he used to drop me off at the Oakland Auditorium in Oakland and it was the uh, rock show of the year that they had every year. And he had all these big names on one bill. I'd see Buddy Holly, wow. Chuck Berry, the Everly Brothers, Jerry Lee, before I played with him later on. And so I was there. So I would wander backstage because I was all by myself and nobody would throw me out. They thought I was somebody's kid. So I was just wandering there. I was standing next to the Everly Brothers and they were talking to the manager. I'd wander back and somebody would say, hey kid, oh, I'm, fi I'm fine, I'm fine. So I got a chance to see them in their dressing rooms warming up. And then I saw the bands set up and I was just exposed to that every year. Um, I think I was about 11 or 12 when I was at the Oakland Auditorium watching those rock shows of the year. So a lot of those people were actually my mentors in a way because I got a chance to watch them and go to all these shows. And the music was very, very simple in those days. Mm -hmm. It was just the way they used what they had, mm -hmm. which was great because it just sounded so full. Yeah, and you know, they didn't have all the pyrotechniques that people need. It was just, no. it was straight across rock and roll at its primal beginning, really. Have you ever yes. seen them? So they didn't have like uh, monitors? Did they have monitors and things like that? They had no monitors. But see, the thing is, they didn't really play super loud. Mm -hmm. So it was great because everything seemed to be balanced and the way that the auditorium was set up, it amplified it as you got back. There was something about the acoustics. Why don't you think they do any more shows there now? It's just because of the, just because they don't want to pump the money into, now it's called Kaiser Center. Uh, they just- Henry J. Kaiser. Yeah, they don't want to. It's not big enough for them to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Grateful Dead did a few shows I years ago the there, you know, and then they had the BAM Awards there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was all about mainly the money, I think, where the Oracle came in and they took that Oakland away. Coliseum so they could get a lot of people in there. And uh, it grew. So when, you, when you're in there and your dad was not, uh, not with you at all all the time, so... What influenced you, what pulled you, because that's your instrument, what pulled you to, to play guitar? Well, of course, my dad, who is a guitar player, and then his guitar players in his band, but when I heard like Chuck Berry, I heard Elvis, his guitar player, Scotty Moore, oh, um, Link Ray, you know, you heard all this energy coming out of the guitar that had been primarily um, a country western kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then rock was new. I was right at the right time, right place and the right time to just enjoy it. You were right at the crest moment. You I was, I was blessed. I'm blessed today. I, I, I believe in that. 
Um, so when you when you started channeling your energy into the guitar, what was your first guitar you had? My first guitar was a Martin acoustic, and my dad said you got to play all your chords on this guitar before you get an electric. And it was tough because all the strings were really really stiff in those days. Okay. Then I got a Tele. And then the one that really blew my mind was when my dad got a Strat for me, mm -hmm. you know, and it had so many sounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, Billy Joe Armstrong, he owns that guitar that I played in those days. Really? Yeah. He bought it from me. Uh, and it was completely worn out because I had and kept it. that's Green Day, for those who don't, might not know. Yes. So what year, was, what year was that when you actually had your first guitar, your electric guitar? Let's, let's yeah. get into your electric. What, what year would that guitar be now? Uh, that would be probably about 57. Oh, oh, oh. Chevrolet's good year also. Are Chevrolet you know? has some good looking Chevys. So your dad made you, did he teach you theory also? You know, did he teach you or did you just have to learn all those chords uh, over a period of time, obviously, but. Well, the people that he played with mm -hmm. were very, very schooled people. Uh, they didn't really use theory as much as they did like chords and numbers. Mm. So it was great because I learned my chords, but I started learning how to play leads, how to play like jazzy leads that was called like Western Swing in those days. But then I got into the rock thing with the energy and I went, oh God, this is great. You turn this up and it was only like 25 watts, but man, did it pack a wallop. <laughs> and now those amps go for like $2,000. Right. You know, but the wallop that that amp gave me, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I started playing the teen clubs and everything and high schools, and then I got in uh, this little click mm -hmm. uh, with the concert promoters through my keyboardist, Carl Battaglia, and, uh, it was great because the next thing you know, we're backing up these doo-wop groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're at the uh, Newark Pavilion, we're at the Vets Hall. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm in this clique and all you had to do was really, really back these guys up the way they wanted to be backed up. So they really, really made it a point to keep guys that were gonna play their music the way they wanted it. And that's how I got into the producing kind of thing because I realized that the vocals had to be up front. I realized that the music had to be organized, that certain things in the music brought the singers back in right. after you do a solo, if you did one, uh, or if, if they did the chorus, you just had to have the right kind of parts. Mm -hmm. And that's where producing actually starts. It's the sum of the right parts. Before we get into your producing and the people that you've worked with, when you when you talk about that, you have a lot of passion right there. Tell me some of the uh, the acts that you opened up or backed up. Who were some of the the rock and roller early pioneers that you opened up with or played behind, helped them out? Oh well, back in those days, I know Richard Berry was one of the first ones, and he had written Louie Louie, and uh, you know there were so many groups after that that did the song, people don't remember, but it was a doo-wop song, right? Wow. And then there was a group called the Five Superiors. They were the ones that really schooled me in singing and, you know, playing the songs a certain way, and, and they were all just great singers. So I'd be on the bill with them, um, <clears throat> you know, Jesse Hill, um, you'd play at the Canry Hall in Hayward, you know, with That's places okay. like that. And uh, it was later that I started playing with, you know, Jerry Lee on the bill with him, that is, and Johnny Cash. But the thing that really pumped me up was that I started being on the bill with people like Jan and Dean. That's a great duo right there. And uh, Bobby Freeman. Bobby Freeman was another one. The swim. And yeah, so. You start seeing people like that, uh, San Pablo Auction Hall, I think they had people like Bobby Rydell out there and, you know. You were uh, right there. You were right all in that. So when you were, let's talk, because I, 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 me and you have had long discussions on different things, and, and I know that this is one of the, uh, a sticking point with you as a, as a producer and as an ear of music, but you also 
or like how you are tonight. You dress in style. Who who made you look that good back in the day? What influ what bands influenced you, or who influenced you? Because we we're gonna look around a little later after the tail end of the interview. Uh, take some of your pictures. What made you look so sharp? Who taught you how to do that? Well, I think in those days, the black groups were the ones that really dressed up. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want anybody on the stage with them that wasn't dressed up. So we'd wear these blazer jackets that were, you know, really cool. And uh, that was where it started. Later on, when I got to the point where I was playing, like some of these pictures up there, I look like Star Wars. Um, I had managers, even in the 60s, that always told us, dress up, make sure that when you go on stage, people want to hear you before you even get up there. Make them be excited to be in the room to experience the act. So when we did that, we started making more money and we started getting, you know, taken seriously, which is really something because everybody was like, you know, starting it. So I would say, you know, that made a big difference. Um, just, you know, watching the way those doo-wop groups dressed. Their voices were so great. They were so great. So you, you started getting into producing, but you always continue to play. How did you get there, you know, when you're producing somebody, how do you sell the vision to them or what you want them to be like? How do you do all of that? Well, the, the production part of it came earlier in starting with these groups, but it really flowered later on when I took that experience with me into the studio to be able to help these people realize what their vision is mm -hmm. and make it materialize. That's really what I think a producer is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I think when you get somebody, you need the artist to lead the production and you need to want to bring the best out in them and get the best out in them. And that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So the experience that I got early on gave me even more uh, of a knowledge and a connection with people, feeling what they were feeling, making sure that everything, just like the groups, how does that feel? Is that your vision? Oh yeah, that sounds really good. Okay, well, I just want to stay in tune with who you are. Because a lot of groups, I don't want to mention some of them, but right. it's almost impossible not to, like a lot of groups would get signed to a major label later on, and they would lose their fan base because other producers wanted them to be something that they weren't. Right. So I think that's the biggest mistake anybody makes is getting in the studio with people and trying to change their direction. Change what they are, who they are, and their directions. You sounded like in that little expose that you just did, you sounded like George Martin to me. Because George God, Martin knew that the four the four Beatles were special, but he also let them do their own, be who they mm -hmm. were. Or we probably, if he wanted to change it, being that he was from a classical background, we might have not had Sgt. Pepper's Rubber Souls, you know, uh, right. that whole that whole genre of great albums, Let It Be, Abbey Road, he let them be there. You know, so we're gonna, I'm gonna jump over, I'm gonna jump over to another subject that's okay. dear to your heart. You, you've done uh, judging contests all over the California and all over the place. Mm -hmm. What was that like and what made you what do you look for when you're a judge, when you're watching somebody, besides the clarity of the song? Or well, I think it's a package deal. Uh, the one thing that I really loved judging was the KBLX talent competition. Okay. And the singers were all so good. Uh, they were just amazing. And all of them were black people, and they were out there to win. And boy, let me tell you, it's like the Warriors, right? <laughs> They're really serious about what they're doing, you know. Right. So I saw some great singing. And just to be there uh, with the KBLX staff, you know, was great. Um, I started to, when I started working with Star Search is when I started deciding who was going to be on the show in the final cut consideration. Right. There was a board of producers down there 
but when I worked at Fantasy there, I started producing that part of what they were going to look at from the Bay Area auditions. And then it started going into the dancing part. So it was, uh, it was kind of like a judging thing also, but I was with the uh, California State Talent Competition for many years. That's where all the trophies come right. from. And I'm in the Hall of Fame for the, the state competition thing. And right. uh, Bill Smithers was, he was a great guy. He just passed away. And my students would go out there and I'd be putting all these different types of production things like Les Mis and Miss Saigon. And I had a great partner in uh, Alice Myers. So it got to be that part of a production thing. And I went, wow, I've never done this before where it's a choir and dancers and almost like a Broadway show. You and I thought- a Broadway show coming right in East Bay. What made you get into teaching and coaching? And, and coaching the artists. How did, how did that concept, and how does your concept of teaching go like that? How do, how do you do that? Well, in, in coaching somebody, you kind of want to show them the best way to do something at their point of quality in their voice. That's the whole thing. It's not how high or how low you sing. Remember, Range is actually determined at point of quality. That's why people like the people that are out now, because it's not like the 80s. It's different. People are trying to be really natural, but they want to be able to bring something to the song that needs to be there to transcend the oh, emotions and the lyrics. Everything needs to like fit. So if somebody doesn't use the right techniques and they're singing too loud, which is what a lot of people do that are in bands when they go into a recording studio, it doesn't work. They're used to hearing themselves out there through the speakers bouncing off the walls. When you go into a recording studio, you're wearing the headphones, the softer you sing, a lot of times the better. So you get to use what I call the register approach. It's what I teach. Black people have been doing it for years, okay? Um, that's why there are a lot of people like Prince, like he was, mm -hmm. uh, Justin Timberlake, yes. Robin Thicke. These guys are actually sopranos. Michael Jackson, right? Michael Jackson. So yes. when you use that register approach and you don't force your voice, you get all these other tones because your voice resonates within your bone structure. I don't want to get too technical, but it's like a fine piece of wood. When you learn how to direct the voice, like I just did now, I can add bass or whatever I want. Without harming yourself. Right. So you can, you can scream, you know, you can scratch, you can do all these things. If you use a mic, use a proper approach. And it really works well for harmonies. When you get guys that all of a sudden they want to sing harmonies, you have to learn to use those other registers to be able to go up high. Mm -hmm. Like the Beach Boys, the Eagles, everybody. Where did it come from, Steve Perry? Where did it come from? The doo-wop groups. They need they were all there the respect. They, I, I totally respect the doo-wop groups. So you did that. You've done been coaching. You've done competition. Tell me, like, you've worked with a lot of producers. Mm -hmm. So tell me about T-Bone, Burnett. Well... I was teaching this kid at the time, Rob Levin, and he was in a band, and uh, it was called Seduction. And uh, they broke up, and some of the other guys went into this band called Big Blue Hearts. Mm -hmm. And so the drummer, I forget what Paul's name is, it's been so many years, but he told T-Bone about me. So they started coming over here to learn how to sing the harmonies because a lot of producers like T-Bone Burnett, you know, and even Jerry Merrill, great producer that I've worked with, they usually would send people to me to get the vocals right so that they can do their producing because they want to just get on with the production and when the vocals aren't right, what are you going to do? <laughs> then it's not right. It's the, <laughs> the main course is the singing 
and there's no uh, cover for it. You just have to really, really, really bring that out and go, okay, we're not going to cover it up with sound. We're going to bring the vocals out because that's the way people listen to music. They want to hear the words. They want to hear the emotion. You know, stuff like that. Um, you work with a producer. Who was a producer when you uh, for Paul McCartney and Bon Jovi? Was it? Uh, oh, I was lucky enough to work with Terry, um, Terry Disley. Yes. He's out there on my wall. Mm -hmm. He, uh, I worked on Guitar Farm with him, and then I did, I think, another session or something he was involved with. But um, I had never met him, and I was doing all this tracking and everything. I played with. Uh, the Tower of Power Horns on a cut on Guitar Farm that was produced by uh, Steve Wolverton. And uh, that's where I got hooked up with, with Terry. And uh, his name is on there on the album Guitar Farm as well. So I was really pumped up that somebody like that, and you don't even know who they're with. Right. You just do whatever you're going to do in this like producer's loop that was created for that album. There were a lot of people on there that were, you know, Carl Durfler. Who did No Doubt? Was that with yes. No Doubt? Yes. Uh, I used to have a picture of him in there, yeah. And um, No Doubt, uh, Christina Aguilera. And Dave Matthews. And Dave Matthews. And he was also involved on Guitar Farm. So that's where I met uh, Carl Durfler. Mm -hmm. One of the people that really blew my mind, though, and I got to tell you, this, this story is kind of incredible. Um, there's a guy named Chris Kermazzi who used to come and see my band Friends. Okay. I was in a really good group for years and we were playing in the Bay Area and Chris used to come and like listen to us and really liked the way we sounded like, you know, the artists and we had all the uh, sequencing and everything. So anyway, uh, Chris is going to get married so he brings his best friend to the club to hear us perform because he wants us to play for his wedding. And that's where I met Walter Afanasiev. And Walter had done a song for Fast Forward, a movie with Sidney Poitier. Walter was going to New York after the wedding to start working with a young girl by the name of Mariah Carey. And so Walter says, uh, I want you to sing one of my songs at Chris's wedding, and then you guys can play for the reception afterwards. And it was by a female vocalist, but I had a real high voice, so I did it, but just working with Walter, and then he was sitting at the piano, and he was like, you know, working me out with it, and I, <laughs> I never realized at that time, because Chris became her guitar player, and then he left her after two years ago with Michael Bolton, but it just blew me away because after that, Mariah Carey's like the biggest thing in the world. And the guy that I had met that I'd worked with was her producer and co-writer. And then he'd done all these other people, Celine Dion, Savage Garden. I mean, Walter. One of my favorite bands, Savage Garden. I like Savage. Yeah. Um, Jerry, uh, Jerry Merrill, uh, Paul Holgate, was, was yeah. one of those, uh, those guys, how was he, uh, what was he like being, doing all that, how, where did you work in that situation with him? Did well, again? Uh, actually, Jerry Merrill wasn't involved with Paul Holgate, but um, Jerry Merrill was just this incredible musician, and he would hire me to do vocals also. I did um, the Outrider album vocals because he wanted the vocals to be a certain way so that when he went in to produce, it was there. He had also later on worked with Gladys Knight and uh, he did this uh, album called Bridge to Havana uh, with Paul Holgate. That was with Matros. That was with Matros. Paul was my student when he was a kid mm -hmm. going to uh, junior high school and uh, he was, uh, you know, on the outside looking in with a lot of bands, but Paul was like really serious. So years later, he's in a band called Heist, 
And he said, Jimmy, I want you to come to my record release party. Because uh, we'd spent years together. So I said, great. So I went over to the record plant and the people that were producing Paul was Journey, their management, Herbie Herbert. And I met Steve Perry and I must have talked to Steve Perry for an hour straight. We just talked about music and the old groups and influences and stuff. I couldn't believe how friendly the guy was and how much we had in common. And uh, it, it was, uh, I guess, an MCA major label deal that uh, Paul Holgate and Heist got. And uh, later on, Paul uh, went with Ronnie Montrose. Went with Ronnie he Montrose. went on tour with him. Paul's got an incredible voice, got incredible great voice. talent. Great, great friend. Um, he's now playing with the Great Golden Band now. That's what yes. he's with with two vocalists. I think there's two vocalists. Um, let's go. Let's go into. Talk, tell me about Troy Lakeda. Um, Well, I met Troy, and it was kind of like the battle of the bands when he was in that when he was a kid and then years later you know he was one of those guys that got into you know mm -hmm. really really being serious about music he was a drummer so you know he was really driven and uh, so he wanted to learn how to produce vocals and work on his voice so, does so he, sing? he came in here just to learn how to use the voice so that he could produce people and tell them, like in a situation where you need this and you need that. Once again, that's producing, singing. He knew it. He knew that the more knowledge that you have of singing, the better off your recordings are gonna be your songs. The bottom line is the singing. So he came in and uh, then later on he moved to Arizona, but right. I did some stuff at his studio in Hayward. Right, on, on Alice, on Alice Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, Troy is a- Great guy. Great guy, great drummer. Um, great drummer, Tesla. Um, let's talk about Miss California. Okay. You know, she's you've done a lot with her, uh, that it would be uh, Jennifer Glover, and she's outstanding. What is she doing now? And well. Jennifer Glover, um, she was really into the pageant thing, and at one point, she had a chance, because of the way she looked, especially, and the way she sounded, she had a chance to be on Jive Records. Wow. So Rob Levin, one of my singer students that I had, Great songwriter, by the way. I think that's the second time I've mentioned Rob, but mm -hmm. he wrote some songs. We showed them to her, and uh, she just walked away from it and wanted to go into another type of Miss California. Okay. So now she's married. She has two children. She lives here in the Castro Valley, okay. and she mentors a lot of the other young Stars. women oh, okay. that are in the system to get scholarships and Helps people out. and help people out. She's just a great, great ambassador. ambassador. She always was. Let's talk about uh, your dealings with Hugh Hefner. God bless you. Well, this is going to be short and sweet. I was uh, doing a radio show at Jack London Square and uh, I was real lucky because we got on KNEW and it was an oldies station. So we were opening, this is when I was with friends, for the drifters and the coasters and people like that on these oldies shows. And then they turned around and said, why don't you guys just do it? You guys sound exactly like people want the songs to sound. So take it. So we had our own radio show. On one of the bills, we had Butch Wax and the Glass Packs. Oh, I remember those guys. <laughs> and they were funny. They and were great, man. They're like the, a different version of Sean and Yeah, and yeah. Bob Sarlot, the comedian. Yes. He's been on Letterman and all that. He yeah. was in the group. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah, and so 
I'm with friends. Um, I'm doing the oldies stuff, but they heard me do Elvis and saw me do Elvis. So they asked me if I would join the group and go on on a tour of the Playboy clubs with them. Oh, that's and weird. that was it. And I was really flattered because they had a guy that did Jerry Lee and stuff, and I looked the part in those days quite a bit. So you had the nice hair, yeah, the, you know, the bump, the pompadour. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't take it, but the fact that I had a chance to go and play the Hugh Hefner circuit that was kind of cool, even though I didn't go, because um, I had my band, I had a good gig. Um, you know, I had the radio show. I was kind of happy where I was you were, at. You were in a lot of different. You were, had a lot of. You had your fingers in the in the pie a lot. So, you did some work uh, with the Mickey Mouse Club. What, what were you doing in the Mickey Mouse Club? Were you helping people sing or? Well, no. Let me tell you how that came about. Um, I was working with a girl by the name of Tara McNair, and she got a chance to be on the Natalie Cole Big Break in Hollywood. Natalie Cole was actually the hostess of this, and it was a great competition. So I had had another act that had went on there and won also, and Tara won. So what wound up happening was before that, her mom and I sat down and sent all these invitations out to all these different agencies. and. We got a bite. When she won, she got a, a Disney offer. So she got a Disney contract for six years, mm -hmm. and that's where that poster came from, by the way, from her. And she was in Florida, but she would come out here six months, in Florida six months. Make a long story short, she sent me the jacket. Got your name on With it. my name on it. And uh, the other girl that I worked with for Disney was uh, Jennifer King. She got on Kids Incorporated. So that was my Disney connection. It was just through my students. It wasn't me personally. Mm -hmm. But then again, it was because I was working with them for them to do what they needed to do for Disney. But that's it. This is you and, uh, this is you and Steve Perry? That's Steve Perry and I and Paul Holgate. Um, that was at his record release party at the record plant. And it was just a mind blower to be there and hang out with Steve Perry and Journey. And uh, it was great to see that happening for Paul. Yes. Because Paul was driven as a kid. Like I say, he was just his own force. Here you are in Star Search. Tell us who that is right there. Uh, that's Ed McMahon. Right. Um, I was at Star Search because I had one of my girls, um, Jenny Davilar, um, was there. And I'm in the hallway, and you're not going to believe this. I'm standing there with somebody, and Ed McMahon invites me to come in and have lunch with him. And he had this spread there. So after a few people, and later on they put me in charge of, like I mentioned earlier, uh, auditions for uh, Northern California. We'd video everything at Fantasy and then send it down to LA for the consideration. So who is this gentleman right down here? That guy on the left is me. Who's your drummer? Playing with the We Three Trio. We bought the Pandora nightclub from Charlie O'Connell, the Bay Bombers, together. Uh, that's Jerry Garcia on the drums, and on the right is Carl Battaglia. The thing about this guy is he played the bass and keyboards at the same time. He actually touched the bass and played the piano and sang like that and stood on one foot a lot. So let's go over to this side of the, the room, and you have like Babylon AD. There's so many people here. You have Babylon AD, you have the CD Outrider, you have um, Veil of Ashes, No Doubt, you have Blue Voodoo there, Murder Bay, Joe Satriani. Out of all these cast of characters, they've all have touched you. There's Troy, 
may ha you have touched each and every one of them. How does that make you feel, Jim? Well, it just makes me feel incredible. I mean, I've been really, really blessed to be around so many wonderful, wonderful people and talented people. Um, you know, I mean, when you see a kid like Derek Davis standing there with Clive Davis, right. um, and he was from Hayward and he was hanging out in my garage, I was doing a band lab with him. Next thing you know, a year or two later, he winds up being signed by Clive Davis and he's on Arista. And, you know, they did the soundtrack for, you know, Robocop. Robocop and uh, they had these albums come out on a major label. So it just makes you feel great, especially when he was very driven, by the way. Uh, these people just don't think that they have a prayer. And then something like that happens and you go, wow, you do have a prayer. You have a prayer. Believe in yourself. That's the thing. If you believe in yourself, who knows what can happen. You're absolutely correct. So before we close this, because we've been pretty extensive in this, Jimmy Bedford is in this book called The San Francisco East Bay 60s, Then and Now, written by uh, Bruce Tossler. It's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And... You were in. You were in very instrumental in actually having the book signing, which was the largest book signing ever at Barnes and Noble. Yeah, that was another thing. I was really lucky. I was just lucky to be there to produce something. I'd never done it, so I just worked with Bruce on it, got it all together, and we even had a second book signing. Mm -hmm. And you were there. You did a great job of him seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it just brought us all together. Rick was there. Rick Stevens, there you know. You know. Uh, Lydia, um, uh, you know. Uh, Roger Collins. Roger Collins, God. The Bo Brummel's uh, Sal. Was Sal there. was there. So it was like, a, kind of like a homecoming because a lot of people have passed away since yes. then. Yes, yeah, exactly. And exactly. Uh, wonderful people and, you know. So I want to thank you for doing this interview with us. You are a wealth of knowledge and God thank bless you. So you. And it is a beautiful day. Every day is a beautiful day. Can I say one last thing? Yeah, wait, before we, yeah, before we do that, this is Jimmy Bedford. He's an iconic in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's a great pal, a great friend. And God bless you, Jimmy. Long life to you. Thank you very much. And I got to say it before we end, in unity. Peace and love to everybody. See you again. This is Jimmy Bedford. We're at his studio, Jimmy Bedford Studios in Castro Valley. So long. <laughs>